Okay, before we begin our lesson tonight, a lot of people on Mother's Day, I didn't know who would be here tonight, so I appreciate you showing up. Uh, just say that, I want you to say this with me. We love you, Pastor. Let's everybody say it now. We love you, Pastor. Now, after this lesson, I want to know if your ladies will say that. <laughs> okay. It'll be good, I promise. Okay, everybody have a syllabus? Okay, let's begin. Verses 3. By the way, at the end, I think I got, I was in another world or something. I got a couple wrong verses, and that's so I'll tell you what they are when I get there, but that's my fault. Okay, in verses 3 and 4, we have seen Paul giving Titus instructions for the church's aged, mature women in the Lord to be the examples, teachers, and mentors to the younger women. We really need that, don't we? This is true especially in the day and age we are living where society has no clue to womanhood. Amen? You watch TV and you have no program that just shows a normal, natural, the way it used to be family. <laughs> I mean, the families are crazy. I mean, they're just goofy. And as you see TV, you know what I mean? I mean, well, they are nasty. They're nasty, they're vulgar, but also they just are crazy in the way they think a home ought to be. And so... Uh, Unless the godly, mature, scriptural, life-tested ladies step up, very few young ladies have much hope. Paul continues in verse 5. The ladies are to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Now he says here to be discreet. This refers to being sound-minded, Women are to have a healthy or rational mind with sensible thinking, not silly all the time. Now, it's not crazy to be silly sometimes, right? You know what I mean. But not all the time, okay? Not all the time. Two, mature ladies are careful about what they say and do. They are prudent in their conversation Maintaining others' confidence in them. If you're over here and you're looking at a, a nice lady, but she's always joking, always kind of goofy, and never can be serious. And then you have a lady over here, she's uh, kind of silent sometimes, and she's not the chatterbox, and she's not, uh, you know, doing all the goofy stuff and everything like that, but you can see she loves God and so on and everything like that. Which one are you going to go to counseling? Which one are you going to say, listen, I have a problem. What would you suggest? Well, it's not going to be the goofy, silly one, right? <laughs> it's going to be the one who has some maturity about themselves, okay? She is not to be driven by personal passions, fashions, or fads that are constantly changing. And boy, that's what's going on today. They go by everything that society and the entertainment world says you need to have, you have to have, you have to be this, that. Those are industries. They're making money off the foolish thinking of people rather than just being your own self. You know what I mean? It says here, she does not go overboard with things, but remains steady, stable, always the same. Her life is viewed as, a, as consistent, reliable, truthful, and committed to God. And once again, that doesn't mean she can't have any fun. <laughs> that doesn't mean, you know, she can't laugh and have a good time and things like that. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying there needs to be some type of stability there. <laughs> She's solid. Then she is to be, you can read those verses. She is to be chaste. 
She maintains a moral purity that infects and influences her home's atmosphere. It amazes me today that a lot of our younger ladies, what they allow their children to talk about, allow their children to wear, and let them out of the house with it on. <laughs> you know, it, it's amazing. And there is a moral looseness with families today. And uh, uh, not this chaste. Uh, two, they are faithful to their vows and marriage by remaining faithfully pure to their mate. In other words, they don't give cause to question or to make you wonder about them or whatever. Uh, three, the older women are to help the younger women to understand that sex with anyone but your mate is sin and has consequences. Amen? Now, very simple, marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Now, I don't know how clear or black and white God could be in stating that right there. Isn't that true? I think it's, I think it's fairly simple. Four, they are to teach younger women that they have to be pure in mind and heart for them to expect to be pure in their practice. Notice it states, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let our cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit perfecting holiness. In other words, they have to be careful, and we'll look at a couple of verses later on, what they put in front of their eyes, what they watch. <laughs> you can watch just TV today, and there's just porn all over it. I mean, it's just available. And uh, they call that now PG. <laughs> Philippians, of course, a great verse. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, honest, just, whatsoever things are pure and lovely, good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Psalm 119, wherewith, wherewith shall a young man cleanse his way, or young lady, by taking heed thereto according to thy word. Their life is controlled by the word of God. They're trying to obey it. Thy word have I hid in my heart. What will it help me do? Not sin against him. And so uh, it's a battle in the mind, isn't it? And the mind needs to be thinking these things. And you can't help but think other things at times because it's thrown right before you but you need to have enough of the word in you to be able to combat that. Three, or five. Why is this so important? Even if it happens, isn't there grace? The answer, ladies, we need good, godly, pure, holy women, examples from you for our younger women. It is hard to explain how important you are in setting a godly standard to inspire the younger women to try to achieve. If they do not see you chaste, more than likely then many won't ever see pure godly women. <laughs> then all they have is the world's loose morals teaching them that anything is okay. Isn't that true? They need to see a standard of a person who's, who's pure, holy, uh, somewhere. And they're not getting it in the schools. They're, unless you go to a Christian school, and even that's questionable. But I understand why a lot of parents are going to homeschooling. <laughs> you understand that today, don't you? So um, they need to see it somewhere. And if we claim the name of Christ, we need to bring with it the testimony for Christ. B, yes, there is grace for sin. Moreover, the law entered that the offense may abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. I'm grateful that the grace of God can go beyond any sin. Uh, okay, I'm grateful for that. 
see. But still, but there are still consequences for women and men. For of this sort are they which creep into houses, leading captive silly women, laden with sins, led away with divers' lust. And then we reap what we sow. D. It is a long way back once you commit this sin. It is a long, tough road, and by observation, most do not have the heart or maturity to discipline themselves to maintain pure minds. Galatians 5 says, For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other. Now get this, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Your flesh is powerful. And uh, it agrees with the world's view. Enjoy yourself. Eat and drink. Tomorrow we die. And as a result of that, it's easy to commit this, these sins. But with the word of God, that can offset that being controlled by the spirit of God. You can't have victory and, and, and conquer your flesh. Six, women, you are to mentor them how to remain chaste and also how impurity can happen. A, it happens through unguarded words. Proverbs says, to keep them from the evil woman, from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman. Let's say there are problems at your house, and the opposite sex says something nice to you that you haven't heard in a long time, that has made you vulnerable. <laughs> when you begin to share, you begin to share intimate things. You have to be very, very careful. B, unguarded thoughts. It says, lust not after her beauty in thine heart, neither let her take thee with her eyelids. In other words, temptation begins with our thoughts. I said a while ago, in the mind. We live in a pornographic society today, and it begins to dominate our thinking. And so you have to be careful. Kelly, pull up some verses for me. Psalm 101, verse 3. Psalm 101, verse 3. Then Job 31, 1. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. Job, I, I think Job, Job made a covenant with his eyes. He said, this is the way it's going to be in my life. And then, uh, or I'm sorry, Psalmist, uh, David, or I don't know if it's David or not, but the Psalmist says this. Then Job 31, 1. Oh, okay. Did you show Psalm 101, verse 3? Okay. No, that's okay. Then Matthew 5, 28. Because it gets you thinking in that direction. Uh, Jesus said this uh, in uh, Matthew 5, 28. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Now, it's interesting. The verbs there in that verse means that uh, he or she begins to look at the opposite sex with fleshly intentions and then they begin to mull it over their minds and they're focusing in on one single person. And God says that that's a sin. Okay, just that simple. And then notice C. Unwise involvement. He says... For by means of a whorish woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread, and the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can one go up on hot coals and his feet not be burned? So he that goeth to his neighbor's wife, whosoever toucheth her shall not be innocent. Okay? If you touch fire, you're going to get burned 
right? <laughs> I've told you before, I think, when I was a little boy, uh, the plug in the wall, some way, uh, they had cut it, and it was wires were sticking out, and the plug was in the wall. And I saw that, and I went over, and I touched that. And when I touched that, my whole arm turned black. I'll never forget that. And uh, back in those days, the way they did it, too, they put butter on burns. That's the worst thing, you know, you could use, your, or Vaseline. <laughs> you know, it just, it just boils. <laughs> so, but uh, I'd remember that. And likewise, if you touch somebody you shouldn't be touching, you're going to get burnt with that fire. Uh, we need to be like Joseph. What did Joseph do when he was tempted? He took off running. He fled. <laughs> okay? And Timothy's told, flee also youthful lust with them that call on God out of a pure heart. Okay? And uh, because there's too much out there and there's too much inside us, the old nature and our flesh, that's attractive to each other. And that's why we have to stay alert. D, another way it happens is by unsound reasoning. Unsound reasoning. But whoso committeth adultery with a woman lacketh understanding. In other words, his reasoning is not sound reasoning, is it? You could say he's stupid. <laughs> okay, that's what it means. And then on the, on the next page, unending consequences. Proverbs 6.33, a wound and dishonor shall he get, and his reproach shall not be wiped away. Even though it's forgiven, he always remembers that. David said, my sin is ever before me. He said, I can't get away from it. It drives me nuts sometimes that I think that I could have done this. And then other people. Now, what do you think when you think of Jim Baker? What do you think when you think of Jimmy Swigert? What do you think of somebody else you know? What, I mean, you know, even though it's forgiven, you, you're great, you're great, grateful they're going on for God, and you can go on. But most don't succeed making it on. A few do, thank God. But that's always in the back of their minds, the back of your mind. And so it's a lasting thing. Uh, how does it affect your character? How does it affect your conscience? How does it affect your control? You see, once you do something like this, it, it opens up a window into your heart and your life and your mindset. And it, that window is always there. And it makes you vulnerable from then on out. And usually people who do this do it again. That's history's proof on that. Okay? Notice then what does it do to your family? You ever think about that? My goodness. What does it, what does it do to your church? You don't sin just to yourself. None of us do. Uh, what would it do to the church? Uh, what does it do to your testimony? And I think sometimes in the heat of the moment, we don't consider the consequences of doing these things. And so we need to step back and remind ourselves of those consequences, and then you go, don't want to go there. Amen? Teach them to put safeguards in their lives as you have. And... Uh, you see there, the word of God and so on. Notice verse 24, the last one. To keep thee from the evil woman or the evil man. Okay? You put the word of God once again. Ephesians 4, 27. Neither give place to the devil. Don't give him an open door. If you take that step through that door, uh, he'll make it wider. He'll make it accessible. Uh, there's a real pull and there's a real draw there that you have the world, you have your flesh, and you have the devil all pulling you toward that direction. And the only way you can stop from going that way is to run the other way toward God through his word, through his spirit, through mature people 
to assist and encourage you to keep on walking for God. It's not deep, but boy, it's hard to make that decision. Amen? Uh, I'm going to quote Philippians 4.13. That printed that out wrong. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Right? Just cross the verse out except for the reference. And then Kelly, pull up James 4.7. That printed out the wrong verse too. I'm sorry. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Now get this. Resist the devil. In other words, it's a battle. You have to fight yourself sometimes. I can't do this. I have to stay on the straight and the narrow for God. I have to do this for my wife. I have to do this for my children, my grandkids, my Christian friends, my church. I have to stay faithful. It's a battle. Okay? How many is muggy in here beside me? It is muggy in here. Stan? Kelly? Okay. I'm sorry if you're chilly already. Cuddle up. <laughs> See, so we're off that subject, okay? But it goes with the next subject, I believe. Being chased, and then it says keepers at home. Paul puts value on a well-kept home. Women are to take care of the house home with its physical and spiritual needs of their children. Kelly, pull up 1 Timothy 5.14. That's the uh, right reference, wrong verse. I missed three of them right in a row. I will therefore, now get this, I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the home, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully okay and then proverbs there verse 27 of 31 there she looketh well to the ways of her household i like it, it says it's hers <laughs> she runs it she controls it this is her domain two it is not saying that she is not allowed to enjoy other interests or work outside the home. But it is saying that she is not to neglect her responsibilities that only she has the ability to do at home for other things outside the home. Her husband and children are her priorities. The house is the family's retreat. Are we having fun yet, ladies? Here's the order. This is the structure to work under. It's God, it's Christ, it's man, it's the woman, it's the children. Now, Christ is not less than the Father, but he even goes by a structure. Likewise, the woman is not less than the man, but she knows and understands there's a structure that we are to follow. Does that make sense? That's really difficult in time and age in which we're living. The day to be a male it's not a very popular thing. <laughs> it seems like society, if they could do away with men and women can go on and bear children to keep the race going on, they would rather do that. That's the mindset of our society today. Now notice what I say here, three. I believe ladies, our ladies, should be hard workers at home, not lazy or unconcerned about their homes. They are interested in everything that pertains to it. They give their best and take pride in their homes. 
why do we put such little value on our homes anymore? Something's wrong. The house should be clean, neat, and presentable to all who enter. Hello? We love Pastor Jim. Let's say this. <laughs> you know, it's just like my truck. I take pride in my truck. I try to keep it clean. I keep oil changed. I do all these things so it run good. I take pride in it. Well, my home is more important than the stupid truck. And a lady ought to take, you don't have to be ridiculous, but it needs to be clean and neat and presentable so that when people do stop by or come in or whatever it might be, it's presentable. I've been in some homes that just are shocking. Huh? I mean, it's unbelievable. You wonder, so when's the last time they ever cleaned? Huh? Notice what I say here. With a husband, children, a house, and responsibilities, motherhood is a full-time job. If a woman is not willing to make the house a home for her family, she should have stayed single. Amen? Amen. So teach them, you elderly, teach the younger to get a grip and do it God's way. Here's a question. Should the wife work at a job outside the home? Okay, I want you to think a little bit on this one. Today, with the high cost of living, it takes two checks to make ends meet. I understand that, okay? But there's another scenario I think it needs to at least be considered and thought through. But let's look at this. So we will have some answers for our younger women. At least consider what it is about working outside the home. Society says you are not very significant or not very accomplished by being just a stay-at-home mom. You know, like when you go to job, you go to uh, the bank or a grocery store and say, now, what, what's your occupation? Well, I, I'm a stay-at-home mom. What? Is that, oh. Like there's less value instead of, that's great. <laughs> huh? You can read that verse too. Satan gets many to question the importance of being a wife or a mom. He says, you will be worth more, valued more if you work. You won't be treated like a second-class citizen any longer. B, he says, you can help your kids with a better education. With more money, we can send them to private schools. See, he says, you can be more independent with more money of your own. You own it anyway, so why would you even consider that? Three, why do women work outside the home? A, their husband demands, demands them to. They say, this marriage is 50-50. If you don't go to work, you're shirking your responsibility to contribute to the finances of this home. Immediately slap him across the face, okay? <laughs> B, they need more money to make ends meet. And I, let me just say, with cost of living, I understand that, okay? But get shorter ends. Hello? Get shorter ends, huh? 
I was looking up the cost of working. <laughs> now I have to have make sure I've got my cars running good, so I need to, or get a second car so I can go to work. Well, I have to have certain clothes now to wear to go to work, you know. Well, I have to buy lunch and everything like that. I have to fill the gas, you know. And on, hello. See, she has believed society and wants personal fulfillment. You know, at work, she's applauded for her success. She's now part of the new world order. Four, we are not saying that it is wrong for women to work outside the home. But there are things in the workforce that could be dangerous in hindering her from fulfilling God's role for her life, husband, kids, and home. Proverbs 31, you can read that sometimes. A, here's some dangers. Working limits her time to develop her God-given priorities of family and home. Let me say that again. Working limits her time to develop to her God-given priorities of family and home. My priorities for my life is God, my mate, my children, The Lord's work, I'll put church, and then my job. That's God's structure for any of us. That's our priority list. Notice where job comes in. And you wonder why people are having marital problems. They get these all jumbled up. They'll put that job, they'll put it up here. You know, or they'll put, you know, it, it gets all out of whack because they violated the structure that God has set up for a marriage. Okay, where am I now? Two or B. Often when she works, she is placing herself under the authority of another man. Now she has two authorities to please. Hello? And if you are fortunate to be under a woman, usually under a woman, it, it can be vicious. Hello? Sometimes you need to talk to Terry, Mayor Tim's wife, when she worked at Lily's under women bosses. And if you don't go along with what they want to do, it's unbelievable. See, now she attempts to please another man in her life. This is done by her time, appearance, attitude, and service. She wants to impress the boss. She wants him to be pleased. And as a result of that, relationships begin to develop. And what happens when the relationship at home when they see each other's dirty laundry and everything, the problems, the pressures, and, you know, and all these things going on at the house, and you got a boss over here, boy, he's not treating you right. D, she gives the best hours of energy to those outside the home. Now home gets the leftovers. <laughs> and with leftovers, the home's needs are not met. The home not only needs quality time, they need quantity time. Okay? Uh, e, she begins to help 
provide the basic needs for home. This removes, this removes some of the husband's manhood, making a potential for his feelings of insecurity. If she's making this and she's contributed this, the man in his mind and his heart, whether he admits it or not, begins to lose some insecurity. He begins to lose some security and he becomes insecure. I'll show you why as we go through this here. F. She now has the ability to develop an independent spirit which could undermine the structure of the marriage. Now... The money that I'm making is mine. Now we have two bank accounts. Huh? Burn one of those and put it in one. Or get a divorce. You know what I mean? That's too hard. I'm not telling you to get divorced. Don't get me wrong. She's got her money. I got my money. Okay, notice what I say. Gee, she now has money power, <laughs> giving her freedom and options. Now when problems or pressures hits the marriage, she thinks she can leave at any time and make it on her own. Let me say something to you. If the man is being abusive... Leaving, get help. If you can patch the marriage, good. But you don't need to stay under those circumstances. If he's hitting on you or whatever, come and see us. We'll help you. But pressure on a marriage, and by the way, there's always pressure on every marriage. I don't care who you are. I don't care what marriage it is. You're going to have problems. You're going to have down times. You're going to have valleys. You're going to have to work through those things, you know. But now, if I'm in those problems and I just get fed up, now I have an option. I have this money now. I, or he could even do that. Men do it too. We're just on the ladies now, okay? Men have responsibilities. I understand this. But now, since she has this, she can do that, okay? I, I wrote down here a survey. Working women, survey, for every $1,000 earned, divorce rates go up 2%. That's amazing. I, I just read that. H. Without mom's discipline and care during the day, the kids now begin to be rebellious or promiscuous in other words the kids then with the husband working now the wife's working they have the kids are left unattended too much huh carol received she was saying to me today we we're talking about mother's day and everything uh, people criticize carol that she worked at Inan National Bank, the old Inan National Bank, and had a good job. And when the kids started going to school, she quit work. And people would say, you know, they criticized her for that. She said, I want to be home. When my kids get home, I want to hear their first stories. And that's what she said, just that simple. And uh, she did great doing that, by the way. I, she begins to develop expectations for her husband to pick up her slack in the home and you have role reversal. It doesn't mean that the husband can't help the wife. Don't get me wrong. Even when the wife's at home, the husband helps the wife at home. I understand that. Okay? Don't get me wrong. But anymore, you look at marriages... And you know who wears the pants. And it's certainly not the man. Huh? 
J, she makes herself vulnerable, not being in God's order for family and the home. Out from God's umbrella of protection, she is left open to emotional, physical, and spiritual situations or compromising situations. Remember, the highest fulfillment and satisfaction in life is to be God's kind of person. It is being and doing what he desires of you. And when I went into that marriage relationship, I was making a vow to my mate and to my God that I'm going to do it God's way. My first priority is my husband, or of course God, then my mate, my husband or my wife, then the kids and so on. But there are many that, who have left this because any more women are making equal or even above men's pay in a lot of areas. And it's very, very tempting. Okay, a mother needs to know that she is an artist, teacher, manager, seamstress, counselor, nutritionist, chef, economist, and so on. Her time is to be used in making her house a home, clean, comfortable, to provide meals, be available, invested in prayer, time in teaching, everyday situations, helping kids to know and love God while assisting her husband to be all he can be for God. Mothers are invaluable. Now we know why Kelly doesn't want any children. <laughs> Five, should women work outside the home? Here are some questions that she needs to ask herself if she works. A, can you still meet the needs of your husband? B, can you still meet the needs of your children? C, can you still maintain your house home responsibilities? D, can you still have time to continue developing your walk with God? And I remind you of Martha and Mary. The answer, if no, then do not work. If you can, fine. Hmm? Do this. A, make your husband truly your main ministry. The goal of my life outside of God is to meet the needs of Carol. That has to be my goal, is to please Carol. That means I dwell with her according to knowledge. I, I've studied her. I learned her. I know her weaknesses. I know her fears. I know her strengths and these things. And you try to put all this together to be able to make her to be all she can be. Then her responsibility is to make me successful too. Okay? B, think. Are there any areas we might be able to cut back on or even some toys we could do without? Is it possible to live more lean or modestly? And let me just say something. That is a big factor today. C, is there a creative way to perhaps work out of the home, out of our home. I remember my daughter Jenny, she would do court recordings. She'd go into where lawyers and the people and attorneys were and stuff like that. She would record, but then she'd go back home and she would type everything at home. She was very, very creative doing that. D, who she used to work for? Just like that. Ken Nunn, just like that. D, make a list of the positive reasons for working. Then a list of the negative reasons of working. 
then honestly evaluate which one allows you to fulfill God's way to glorify him. Huh? I've told you before, Karen and I did that, Chattanooga, when our kids... We put them in a Christian school down there. Now, you have to understand, I'm just doing concrete on the side. I'm going to school. Carol got a job of a lifetime in a bank and hiring and, you know, employment area of the bank and so on. But our house was chaotic. She'd leave early. She'd come home late that first week. How long did you work, Carol, then? A couple weeks? Two days. That's right, two days. Now, She's sharp. It wasn't a job, but it was everything else she knew what was needed. And so we sat down. We made a list of the negative and the list of the positive. We looked at it, and we just by looking at that, the, the, the working was more for things, or you know what I mean? Whereas the other things, the important things, God, family, sir, you know, all these things, our growth, the important things that are for mom and her children and so on. And we made the decision, and we're poor as mud. We lived on one year when we were down there on how much? $3,000 for the year. Mm -hmm. We prayed a lot. And let me say something to you. I think that's what's wrong today. People take the equation of God out of it. And they don't trust him that when they try to fulfill what he wants them to do, he will provide for their needs. And God never failed us one time. Huh? It come in, money come in supernaturally. I had checks in the mail. I, I, don't, I won't know until I get to heaven. Showers of blessing. <laughs> it, well, it taught me faith. Well, the rest of the guys, most of them, they had GI bills and stuff like that they were going to school for. I said, why don't you come over on the faith side? <laughs> huh? Amen. But it, it worked out. I mean, it worked out. And even when we started Emmanuel, they promised to give me $150 a week. And I have two kids going to Bethesda. Then you have your house and everything. So I work three days a week, and I knock on doors three days a week. And then I'd preach on Sundays and Wednesday nights. But God was faithful. And Carol stayed home all that time. She's a lazy woman. I'm, <laughs> I'm kidding. No, I just think you get your priorities right and trust God. Amen. Oh, me. Which is it? Remember, we are not condemning ladies who work, but women are not to forget the importance of being keepers at home. There will never be great local churches without great Christian families, and there will never be great Christian families without great Christian fathers and mothers. And great homes make great churches. Amen. Just like you, you're wanting to serve and your house is splintered, blown apart. How could you be effective? You understand what I just said? I mean, you're wanting to do something for God and then all these other stuff. How can you focus on this when all of this is going on? Last page. What time is it? Okay, I'm going to fly. Mother's i got a couple of verses here wrong right off the bat. Mothers are to be women of character. They ought to be upright, virtuous, and selfless before God. Kelly, pull up Luke 10, 42. Scribble out this other and put in Luke 10, 42. And then Kelly, get ready to pull up Acts 9, 36. But one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen, what? That good part. A good woman chooses good things. 
okay? And then Acts 9, 36. Now there was at Joppa a certain disciple named uh, Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. This woman was full of a good woman does good things. Amen? Two, what a compliment. I'm sorry, what a compliment. What a compliment. Now she is a good woman. Or what a complaint. The meanest creature of the side of hell is a mean woman. <laughs> Am I stepping on your toes too much? My aunt was a mean woman. <laughs> this old drunk came up to our house one night, and of course, with all the, you know, we have the girls in the house and everything. They had seven sisters and everything. Boy, my aunt went out there, and he held on to the, what would you call it, the banister or whatever. And boy, she just pulled him, and that thing broke, and boy, she just threw him out in the yard. She is mean. <laughs> She's a tough old cookie. <laughs> F. Obedient to their own husbands. She is, and by the way, it says, I think it says own because she's not supposed to be obedient to other men, but to her own husband, okay? She is to assume a subordinate position to her husband. It is not the husband's forcing his wife, but she in obedience voluntarily assumes her role to follow her husband's lead. She needs all she can do to follow his lead. Now, you can talk things over and so on, but when the decision is made, she tries to help him to become a leader. And he won't ever become a leader if she's always making the decisions. Hello? And God holds him accountable to be the head of the home. You understand that? Help him be the head of the home. 1 Corinthians 11, and we have it on the board, but I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Just like I have up here. Two, this does not mean that she is in any way inferior to her husband. Absolutely not. But it does mean that God who created man and woman with their distinct qualities, says that these are the roles that men and women must do for harmony and happiness in the marital relationship. She's not inferior. She understands the structure God has set up for marriage in the home. And she's willing to fulfill her position of that godly woman, just like the man. He understands that he is to be the head of the home, but he's under Christ, and he's supposed to follow Christ. If we get mad, you have to get mad at God <laughs> for this, okay? Ephesians 5, submitting yourselves one to another. Let me just say, there are times we do submit to each other, don't we? There are times Carol's way ahead of me, and I say, you're right. We'll do that. That's great. There's a give and take. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. Now, let me just say something about that. Allow him to be the leader. Allow him to be the head of the home. Doesn't mean that he doesn't communicate with you, discuss, you know, if you're I've always said if you buy anything big, you need to sit down and discuss it with each other and come out with the best decision. Sometimes, you know, you discuss that, you come out, it's his decision. Sometimes you discuss it, say, you know, you're right. It's her decision. But he goes on, makes that decision, it's hers. That's a give and take relationship, isn't it? Okay? But nobody's inferior to anybody. We're joint heirs with Christ. Both of us are. And by the way, why, does, why do women today hate the word submit so much? Why, why do they hate that? I mean, it's in the Bible. Why would we hate what God wrote? I want to do what I want to do. <laughs> now, if that's your attitude, you're all wet. <laughs> Amen. 
I hope that's not the attitude. Maybe your husband's not leading. So you say, I better leave. And I know sometimes because the husband vacates his, his responsibilities, if it's not for the wife, nothing's going to get done. You know, even Paul, he used lots of godly women in ministry. Now I'm asking, where's the men? I don't know if they were killed, set aside. Carol? Sometimes because the way men use it, hey, baby, you're supposed to submit to me. I'm the man of the home. And that's stupid. We understand that, okay? We're talking about somebody who's trying to make a, a good effort of being a good husband, a good father, a good head of the home. You want to encourage him to be that. Now, if your husband says, I want you to do this, and it's sin, what do you do? You say, no way, Jose. You don't follow him in sin. You let him sin. When it was time to sin, Daniel stood up against authority. Amen? There's a time you can stand up against authority when it's going the wrong direction and it's going to cause sin. No. Well, he wants to go bars and drink and he wants me to go with him. Say, you're going on your own, kid, not with me. Huh? Okay, a woman has her place in God's economy for a specific purpose, but he did not create her to rule man. Hello? It's not the wife's job to control her husband, manipulate her husband. Uh, back up there in 1 Peter there, likewise you wise be in subjection to your own husbands. And here's the promise. That if any obey not the word, the husband, they also may without the word by, uh, be won by the conversation or the behavior of the wives. There's something about you fulfilling your role that God will honor that to work in his heart. The last part, G, that the word of God be not blasphemed. The younger one, women, if putting these things into their lives, do not bring slander or reproach, reproach against God's truth. By your godly lives, esteem God's word. You can either be a reproach to what God says the home's supposed to be like, or you, are, or you can bring an esteem a high level of praise to the word of God for the structure God has set up for everybody to be able to, to function just like the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They're all three equal, but they operate differently. And the Son, when he came to earth, he said, I come to do my Father's will. He submitted, but yet he's God himself. So if Christ is willing to do that, we shouldn't have a problem, okay? Notice 1 Timothy, let as many, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed, okay? Homes have structure. With too many chiefs and not enough engines, it doesn't get done. Sometimes I would used to be on a construction job, and everybody's telling you what to do. And it's just complete chaos. This one says, well, we need to do this. That one said, well, do it this way. Well, said, no, let's do it this way. And they just needed one chief. <laughs> you know, said, this is what we're going to do. Don't want any comment. This, <laughs> you know, and it functions so much better. And God knows what the home needs between a husband and a wife. And that's where your trust your faith comes in, okay? Now, we've been focusing on women. I know that uh, we focused on men earlier on, especially preachers, and I skinned myself, okay? So we all have responsibilities, don't we? That last part, inconsistent living in women's lives, contradicting God's truth, open a door for unbelievers to reproach and disgrace 
God's name, his gospel, and his church. When we get out of line and we're a terrible testimony to an outside world, it doesn't do anything but bring shame to the name of Christ who created marriage and has a plan for it, and he wants us to follow it. Okay, let's all say together again. We love you, Pastor Jim. Ha, 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 ha.